So welcome to the um, lecture series of the Documenta Institute. Um, for those who don't know, Documenta Institute has been around for about two years. Um, and we're a research institution um, that looks at the um, history of Documenta, that does research on Documenta itself, but also beyond um, the art, this art invent. Um, so we look at the social relevance of art. We think a lot about um, what's the future of art. Um, and this is very much uh, the spirit of this lecture series. Um, because last year we had Documenta 15, and during Documenta 15, uh, we organized a series of uh, lectures called Forgifted uh, Verhältnisse, which looks more specifically at the history of Documenta itself. And this year we are um, pulling together our resources as um, the three of us, the three Documenta professors, Liliana Gomez, uh, Felix Vogel, who's not here today, and myself, we are um, co-organizing this uh, lecture series that, um, that looks beyond um, uh, this artistic invent of Documenta, but rather questions um, art in its larger social context. So I'm very thrilled to invite um, Gary, Josie, Zhang, to our kickoff lecture. I'm gonna say something about your <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, so Gary is a lecturer at, um, uh, in the critical, critical studies program of uh, Goldsmith. Um, he's also affiliated as a uh, senior research associate at the Serpentine Gallery, where uh, uh, he and Victoria Ivanova have been putting out um, a sort of high level <laughs> report on the future of art called the future art ecosystem um, which is a lot about um, the back end development of, of of art institutions but also art in other kinds of um, organizations so where is the place of art how can we upstream art in um, r d processes in decision making processes um, and so forth um, Gary is also the lead of R&D in the Rockbound Museum in Shanghai. And this is just one, this is just a three of the many other hats that you have. Um, Gary is also the author of a forthcoming book called Catastrophe Times, which is slotted to come out in two weeks um, uh, via MIT Press. So this is also something that we're going to speak about. Um, yeah, so I asked Gary to essentially group all the different things that he does together into a one hour lecture. And uh, I think we'll hopefully we'll still have uh, ample time to have discussions. Yeah, so over to you, Gary. Thank you so much, Mi. And um, yeah, I, my brief was to bring some of these different strands of work together and they don't always happen together, so what results is a slightly Frankenstein trifle kind of situation of a, a, a series of different kinds of components uh, broadly circulating around art and economy, but yeah, it goes. <coughs> okay, so the name of the lecture, the, the, great f the Greater Fool Theory, names this intuitive idea in markets and Basically, the idea that, that it doesn't really matter if uh, something is overvalued as long as you have someone else to sell it to, um, as long as someone will buy it at a higher price. And cheap credit creates, like, in effect, kind of surplus futurity, and we've seen this over the last kind of 10, 15 years, that under certain economic conditions, such as very low interest rates, where money is easy to borrow but hard to grow, investors are paid to take risks. I mean, the theory goes that eventually you're supposed to run out of greater fools, and its more challenging counterpart is the greater value theory, the idea of you know investing in stuff that's actually valuable in the long term. Um, but when speculative momentum is centered around social technologies primarily, optimizing around heavily narrative-driven overhauls such as Web3 taking over from fiat currency or life moving onto the metaverse, greater full and greater value become kind of more of a spectrum driven by essentially forces of collective manifestation. In this kind of narrative-drenched environment, the popping of a bubble far from returning the market to a more earnest state of reality merely serves to demonstrate that the liquidity conditions were not sufficient to cross the full value threshold. 
And this is a, a slide from, I don't know how many people have seen these before. It's like Masayoshi Son's legendary um, uh, end of year um, presentations, the director of SoftBank. Um, so this was particularly true in the post-2008 era, which emboldened the blue skies techno-futurism of behemoth investors such as um, SoftBank and Saudi Arabia's vision funds, the $154 billion fire hose behind the most ubiquitous unicorn, unicorn startups of, of the 2010s, from Uber to WeWork. In an era of easy wins, it became unremarkable to place multi-billion dollar bets on relatively slim prospects of monopoly, acquisition or exit, creating meteoric valuations while a small demographic of software developers enjoyed a golden age of compensation. More recently, vast investments by Silicon Valley in the direction of Web3 and the metaverse, as well as now AI, as well as the bigger retrofuturist monumentalisms of things like the Saudi smart city Neom, cap off the speculative temporality of the 2010s, which grew increasingly unhinged from any reality of um, beyond this kind of self-referential force of capital allocation. Credit begets credit, so the theory goes, and building FOMO around a promise until its non-fulfillment becomes unthinkable, turning a delusional claim into a mathematical ine inevitability. So when these speculative conditions no longer obtain, say when interest rates suddenly start to rise, money no longer flows so freely and risk becomes more expensive, what happens? I mean, if certain economic conditions enable the proliferation of certain kinds of technological narratives that shape our real social conditions, let's say platforms that have come to dominate much of our lives over the last 15 years, um, and those global conditions are rapidly changing, can we say the same for cultural production? Do we say the same for contemporary art? Artistic practices have long engaged in some way with economy, a pairing which invokes the crossing of a membrane that separates art from life representation from reality. Artistic experiments in economic structures conversely demonstrate two, do two other dimensions of this relationship that are conventionally disguised. That art itself is subject to an economy, that art is an economy, and also that the economy itself is constructed, contingent, and the grand collective fiction, a kind of living work of art. Such systematic engagements have evolved over the years in response to the changing economic environments, from the grand social designs of modernism to positions of, cr of critical negation, ironic mimesis, and more engaged forms of complicity. In the past few years, and I'll talk about this later, we've seen a renewed spate of practices engaging more tactically with economic realism. So in the following, I'll attempt to think through some engagements between art and economy not as an art historian, just as someone who happens to be involved in a number of institutions and initiatives engaged in the past and present of this discourse. And so this talk, because like I said, is a bit of a mashup, which is mostly through a couple of projects, uh, one being a book called Catastrophe Time, uh, it's coming out in a couple of weeks, and another which is Future Art Ecosystems, which is a strategic briefing series with Serpentine. Um, so there's a missing third term in this relationship, which is technology. I avoided technology in the title, partly because of that meme, and partly because art and tech has become such a diffuse, overhyped, and overstated set of practices. But first, there, is, there are two important reasons that technology kind of is a, a major medium here. I mean, w one is that tech in our time has become synonymous with the speculative claims about collective futurity, a space which was once claimed by artistic avant-garde across the 20th century. And from nation <coughs> over the 20th century, from nation-building projects of constructivism and fascism before the Second World War to syntheses of art, science, and technology imagined during the Cold War rationalism era. And then since the decline of US manufacturing by the 1980s and the rise of finance and later data-driven industries as a dominant force of GDP, the tech sector has emerged as the headline driver of growth and investment. Basically, tech is the main story. And you can kind of see this, you know, this r ridiculous, um, NASDAQ chart that you can shows how like tech stocks have mostly grown from like what two thousand to eighteen thousand or something within like the decade of the twenty tens. So since at least the dot com era and particularly past two thousand eight, it is Silicon Valley and its global counterparts with the narratives of heroic entrepreneurialism and large scale social disruption that lay claim, however performatively, to the popular avant garde. Moreover, like modernist avant-garde before it, its claim to futurity is built on design for the masses. 
In many ways, the internet we have today is built by e-commerce. And it is by monopolizing the temporal flux of everyday life that te contemporary technoculture has sought new informatic and commercial vectors. To put it in business terms, a venture capital investment is a speculative bet on the total addressable market, TAM, the maximum size of a potential future opportunity for a given product. Basically, how many people you can imagine ever using it. <clears throat> Secondly, particularly since the ultra-cheap money era of 2008, the most prominent technologies are centered specifically around the design of social reality. How we interface with one another, with the city, with culture, with neighbor, with commerce. How we operate and are operated upon by what Benjamin Bratton calls the accidental megastructure of planetary scale computation. On a much more banal level, it's difficult to overestimate the psychosocial reach of everyday interfaces, like a simple push notification, to reach populations of billions in a way through individualized feedback, which is hardly imaginable a couple of decades ago. So, after that um, sort of sidetrack into tech, this is kind of the main focus of the talk, which is this kind of like wider narrative around arts and economy. I don't know how well you can see this in the light. I can kind of see it here. Um, so increasingly, art and technology meet in this indeterminate space of economic speculation. It's perhaps telling that forms of art or art in a, in a form, such as non-functional images and text, have been the primary artifacts driving both two recent hype cycles of technology, NFTs and generative AIs. But the gaps between contemporary art's canonical claims towards social transformation and its realities are now growing increasingly wide. Today, as cultural institutions increasingly flounder for legitimacy, relevance, and funding, the critical tactics and cultural aesthetics once native to contemporary art have found themselves absorbed into wider cultural domains. You could say that this was the point, that the old McLuhanite claim about artists being the antennae of the future has been met with the Boisean mantra that everyone is an artist. And perhaps Boyce was right. The social organism is a work of art. It's just not being shaped by contemporary artists. So I guess the question then becomes, what would it mean for artistic practices to reorient their relationship to economy and society from failures of criticality towards something more constructive? And what this amounts to in the crudest terms is to ask artistic practice not only to explore, subvert, or engage, but to practice in substance what it preaches in theory. Uh, this is a, a nice book that some of the material is, is drawn from in terms of the historical work in the 60s and 70s. Um, so there are precedents to this. Um, in the 60s and 70s, uh, arguably a much more optimistic era of art, science, and industry, even in the shadow of mutually assured destruction, saw a number of pioneering programs that sought to position the artist as a cultural researcher and instigator within society at large. I mean, I imagine m many of you are familiar with these. So this, is, this includes um, Artist Placement Group in Britain, which inserted the artist conceived as an incidental person, a disinter disinterested interloper into the midst of government and industry. And also Georgie Kepesh's claim around uh, commitments to art at civic scale. This is Kepesh um, at the Center of Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. In this period of intense social and technological transformation in the post-war era, these initiatives sought to expand artistic research beyond gallery walls, integrating artistic labors with those more obviously productive domains of advanced industrial society. This is more images from CAVS, but I think it's actually work from maybe Otto Pino's Zero Group, kind of kinetic works they were doing at the time. So Kepesh became one of a number of eminent Jewish artists, architects, and intellectuals who emigrated to America before the Second World War, alongside Mahali Naj and Walter Gropius, each actually becoming prominent in East Coast American institutions, Gropius at GSD, Mahali Naj at RISD, and, but to the point that they, they brought with them the mass avant-gardism of the European Bauhaus. In the era of blazing techno-scientific advances, the tarnished nationalistic character of European modernism was replaced by American liberalism and rise of Cold War ra rationality. This was an era during which there could be little doubt that technology was an agent of social, social transformation. This is um, Artist Placement Group. I mean, you'll find that a lot of these older projects, what actually happened is just people sitting at tables together. 
like artists and scientists ostensibly or like artists and other people, but they're really mostly just having these conferences all the time, or at least that's the main kind of like documents of, of their activity. And and very often when you actually go into the, the kind of materials as, as um, they do in that book, um, they, they're, they're fighting usually. So for their part, artist placement groups saw the role of the artist in the factory, the government department, the civil service office, and other sites of societal agency as serving what they called the missing third clients. Like noise on a signal or a perturbation that causes the genetic codes to mutate, they saw the third clients as an as yet undiscovered goal at neither end of the existing transaction, but situated elsewhere in the future. In doing so, Artist Placement Group also kind of preempted the role of the artist entrepreneur and the artist consultant, which so well characterize an industrial transi transition from the corporate bureaucracy of the post-war era to the endlessly flexible, risk-taking entrepreneur of the post-1980s. This is Jack Burnham. So in this decade since, the hope that artists would become, quote, makers of aesthetic decisions in the new, quote, systems-oriented culture, as Jack Burnham once proposed in his 1968 essay, Systems Aesthetics, remained largely unrealized. Burnham was a fellow at CAVS under Kepesh, an early visionary around art and technology, and also a longtime collaborator of Hans Hacker. And there's a kind of interesting link, a break and a link between this period of, like, art technology claims towards systemic practices in the 60s and 70s towards later institutional critique practices, where someone like Hacker, I guess, is one of the main links. Today, one could say that the imagined artist who offers incisive critiques from radical visions has been partially superseded by the management consultants, mercenaries how to tell, uh, hired to tell C-level executives just how bad they've been, and the startup founder, today's heroic ideal of the starving entrepreneur, burning out in pursuit of cultural disruption. For artists, negotiating this terrain simultaneously as creative, critical, and economic agents demands a comparable degree of cynicism, agility, and entrepreneurial plasticity like never before. These days, some of the best artists aspire to be the worst of CEOs. So back to the big chart. So what follows will be an attempt to loosely historicize the encounters between art and economy since that earlier phase epitomized by Burnham. The general idea is that art's relationship to economy shifted from a lens of institutional critique to a position of self-conscious complicity in the period before and after 2008, before being forced into a kind of strategic realism as a generational narrative arc kind of broke down over the 2010s, most pronouncedly over the last few years. So the question is like, what era are we in now? In 2023, the period between the early 90s, well now, looking back now, the period between the early 90s and the crisis of 2008 resembles something like a quaint geopolitical time bubble in which we lapsed the end of history. The 2010s saw the steady breakdown of the globalization narrative, right-wing populism, economic austerity, rising climate urgencies, and social media frenzy. From where I'm standing now, micro-generational identities amongst my own peers across these decades are divided across formative bursts of collective optimism and sudden disillusionment, many of them economic. The anti-globalization movement, Web 2.0, open source, Occupy, Arab Spring, anti-austerity, Corbyn Sanders, Black Lives Matter, crypto boom and bust. For many in the global north, this scattershot of cultural mobilizations form the coordinates of socio-political imagination in a world sliding into crisis, but nonetheless open, networked, and mobile. COVID brought this world to a halt, resurfacing the totality of a fractured planet, while the Russian invasion of Ukraine further entrenched the revenge of the real through energy crisis, commodity crisis, geopolitical breakdown, and genocidal warfare. And so now we're kind of back into a Cold War schedule. So that period can roughly be split maybe into three parts, like before 2008, after 2008, and then kind of the, 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 the sort of breakdown polycrisis moment that we seem to be in now. So the first part between the 90s and 2008 crisis was a period known in the US, uh, by economists at least, as the Great Moderation, which um, it's a period that enjoyed low interest rates, low inflation, rising asset prices. 
if price stability and GDP can serve as some kind of measure of temporal stability, then in the global north, this was a period of relative calm, which masked some deep structural redistributions in the world beneath. Over this period, as globalization, productivity gains, and financialization since the late 70s shifted the balance of power between labor and capital, the profits accrued to the latter were funneled into the expansion of credit, offering politicians a good way to defer the costs of post-industrialization. In the US-led West, the center of gravity of the good life, so-called, shifted from the sphere of labor to the growth in financial assets binding everyday futurities to market prospects. For elected politicians, the expansion of easy credit became a useful palliative for sharply rising inequalities. As the political economist Ben Ansel shows, the decoupling of social security from employment towards financial asset ownership shifted voters' priorities away from social safety nets and labor laws and towards the maintenance of mortgages, loans, and pensions, all sustained by a growing financial sector. Meanwhile, the supply side effects of globalization, Chinese imports outsourcing to cheaper labor markets, increased technological productivity and deregulated financial flows, kept prices low for the world's most advanced economies. This was in a way the implicit bargain of the end of history, a long bet on the fortunes of a deeply asymmetrical global economy fueled on easy credit. <clears throat> Over this period, the globalized art world of fairs, biennials, and cosmopolitan avant-gardism blossomed alongside the rise of contemporary art as a financial asset class. Art's post-conceptual dematerialization largely mirrored the seamless fluidity of global capital investment and flexible entrepreneurialism. Critical and alternative modalities like media art and institutional critique also bloomed in the 90s, promoted by state research investments like EU Horizon, for instance, and critical discourses around the ascent of neoliberalism, gentrification, artistic co-optation by global capital flows were also kind of going strong. But while they maintained a degree of intellectual rigor and prestige, the counter these counterpositions were largely upheld by the uneven but stable structure of the overall, overall economic narrative. Institutions welcomed their own critique, making for a perfectly sustainable industry. <clears throat> the second part begins with the great financial crisis itself. In the strange new world of negative interest rates and fewer ways to earn steady returns, investors were paid to take risk. Money flowed into the stock market, venture capital funds, corporate credit account, current accounts, especially tech companies. And in the post-crash decade, stock markets were defined by companies with meteoric share price growth and negative earnings. As a speculative tide lifted all ships, this period also saw the ascendancy of asset managers, leviathans whose fortunes rise and fall with the overall stock market. Um, for example, between 2009 and 2022, BlackRock saw its assets under management increase tenfold to 10 trillion, while the S&P 500 saw the longest bull run in history, creating another generation of adults who had only ever known the stock markets to rise. Indicative of its growing status as a global asset class, the art market bounced back just fine after 2008, resurging in value with a vigor that surpassed even the S&P. I mean, art beat the market, so to speak. Um, faith in the stability of global economic narratives, however, had been deeply shaken. As some of the UK's top economists famously admitted to the Queen of England in the aftermath, what had seemed like a miracle of financial engineering turned out, quote, fueled to be fueled not by virtue, but by delusion. After unprecedented bouts of quantitative easing after 2008, banks at the brink of collapse discovered that they were backstopped by unlimited liquidity pulling the world into a strange era of negative yields. Far from pulling the rug from systemic conditions that led to the crisis, the system turned out to be rugs all the way down. This decade saw rapid iterations of this kind of art and economy genre. There were poetic uh, performative entanglements such as Golden and Sandabee's Headless, a kind of ten, eight, 10 year long project, a kind of odyssey into offshore finance as well as these kind of more studiously ironic, um, ambivalent positions taken up by post-internet collectives and things like the Disc Biennial in uh, 2016, I think. Um, at, some point, these, at some point in the later end of the decade, these gave way to strategies of assimilation and acceleration, whether by inclination or necessity. One could think of this as a kind of parafictional turn, 
where the unraveling of long-held economic structures was met by a flurry of speculations, social experiments on various scales, all grasping towards uncertainty. Movements like Occupy brought widespread recognition towards the dysfunctionality of the financialized economy. And in the early days of Bitcoin, the, the, web two point, uh, the early web utopianism was re-imbued with ambitions of systemic overhaul. While incipient social imaginaries from all sides of the political spectrum proliferated alongside kindred promises of disruption from ven venture capital, led by the likes of A16Z and Sof uh, SoftBank. This was also the era of the artist consultants, a kind of recapitulation of the artist placement group's earlier activities, institutional activities in the 60s and 70s, but now updated for the startup founder. Artists who had, if nothing else, an acutely trained cultural intelligence started positioning themselves as McLuhanite antennae of the future, except by now the avant-garde was more of a service. The canonical example of the 2010s was probably the tre trend forecasting agency K-Hole, which were very early on this. They were formed by four art school friends who, while grifting in fashion industry jobs in the New York, became interested in what they called the total collapse that comes with being the thing itself, which is quite a good mantra for art and economy. As it turns out, they were exceptionally good at the thing itself, publishing punchy trend reports on emerging youth cultures, while their status as imposters in both art and business engendered a double agency that saw them lauded at both Freeze and the World, e World Economic Forum. Briefly, their activity as precarious artists hustling at the coalface of culture became both valuable and profitable. However, as Dina Iago, one of the co-founders, later reflected in an Eflux article, business LARPing had its limits, and those were mostly found in the boardroom. We concede, she said, we conceded that seeing, our f seeing the future does not equal changing it. Networks of power and influence remain the same. The flip side of this is you might call something like the kind of grifter founder complex. I mean, it's not for no reason that f uh, over the same period, the tech founder scam artist has become a kind of anti-hero protagonist of contemporary capitalism. This is the love-hate story starring the likes of Elizabeth Holmes, Sank Bankman Fried, Adam Neumann, um, Martin Shkreli, Anna Delvey, and in some larger and deeper sense, maybe Elon Musk. Like the medieval king, the grifter founder has two bodies. One is a genius entrepreneur who's conquered the market with the Herculean skill and charisma of a minor deity, and the other is a sociopath who acted on the suspicion that the rest of us merely entertained, that the market is a kind of consensual hallucination, a delusional casino in which the house is other people, and you can bluff your way to the top as long as you pile the stakes high enough. And if the grifter founder keeps winning, then that genius obtains. If the bubble pops, then the redemption arc lies in having seen through the matrix while the other wage cucks labor on. A few months before his cryptocurrency exchange FTX collapsed over defrauding customers for billions, Sam Bankman Fried bemused to Bloomberg, and this is kind of a wonderful quote. Uh, he says, and now all of a sudden everyone's like, wow, people just decided to put $200 million into this box. This is a pretty cool box, right? Like this is a valuable box as demonstrated by all the money people have apparently decided should be in the box. And who are we to say they're wrong about that? Like, you know, this is, boxes can be great. You're like, well, I'm in the Ponzi business and it's pretty good. And this was with Bloomberg, uh, yeah, like a few months or like six months or something before FTX collapsed, I think. <clears throat> These high rollers in the great game of speculations become objects of intense attachment, ire, and adulation, as well as Netflix series, because they, are perform they performatively disclose the fetish. By becoming the proposition so good it can't help but be true, they embody the impossible objects of the market's desires, seducing even the most apparently august of institutions. J.P. Morgan in the case of Neumann, Henry Kissinger for Elizabeth Holmes, New York High Society for Delvey, the SEC for Bankman Fried, and the Bloomberg reporter covering Shkreli, who later became his fiance. In a word, they kind of became artists. So what then, or what, what now rather? Like we're kind of, we're, I mean, I, don't, I can't really tell if you, where the timeline is, it's off the screen, but we're kind of at the very end of the, the timeline now. <clears throat> so the third part brings us into the present. 
In the past decade or so, a number of artists and institutions have been recognizing the growing cultural power of technology industries and, and increasingly have sought in different ways to insert themselves into that supply chain. Projects like the Serpentine R&D sought to negotiate a seemingly unholy alliance between art and big tech, and whether that will become more sanctified remains to be seen. On the Silicon Valley side, figures like Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen have taken more actively, acti openly activist positions, fomenting their own intellectual movements in relation to domestic politics and geopolitical entanglements. Meanwhile, billionaire-founded think tanks like Berger Institute in LA and Strelker in Moscow, until it closed, uh, started taking <coughs> more activist positions themselves, putting their unmatched financial resources behind speculative philosophical agendas in part skimming the intellectual oversupply left behind by the under-resourced and crisis-ridden university sector. This mixed picture of emerging private and public institutional engagements with systemic agendas is broadly concerned with the techno-economic organization of society and culture. They resemble a different style of entanglement with technology, entrepreneurialism, and corporate logics to say, Bernadette Corporation in the 1990s, or the knowing complicity of the post-internet tendency. They seem to sit alongside, but also hit differently to institutional critiques since the 90s. They are both at once more shrewd and more naive than the discourses developed in recent decades by artists like Andrea Fraser and Hita Stahl, or theorists like Andrea Phillips, Tierra Jorgad, or Suhail Malik. This kind of like rich discourse of ins uh, institutional critique around art and economy, which has developed but never quite landed. At a very, a very tentative comment on the difference would be that this, uh, those systemic discourses emerged out of a globalization narrative still in ascendance and relative institution abundance. Well, after the period following 2016, uh, we saw just an increasingly certain breakdown of that order, including admitted by the billionaires themselves. One might say that the conditions of scarcity that we see today afford a degree of, of strategic realism that are hard to discover when the liquidity is more flowing. This new situation demanded a move beyond critique. Its entanglement with power also appear to follow a pendulum swing from entrepreneurialism to institutionalism, seeking to intervene less through the market than we saw in the kind of immediate post-2008 era, than in the spaces of cultural policy, stake-backed risk-taking, and public sector R&D. In effect, they become kind of more like public sector lobby groups. <clears throat> so, one in, uh, as one attempt in such a move, I'll finish with the example of future art ecosystems, which began in 2019 as part of Serpentine R&D's platform, um, a satellite department which itself grew out of the digital commissioning program led by the uh, institution's CTO, Ben Vickers. Conceived as a strategic briefing and written by Victor's, uh, it was written by Vickers with Victoria Ivanova, Sofia Nechev, and Rival Strategy. The first Fay report was based on a series of bold claims about the fortunes of art, technology, and creative R&D, roughly summarized as follows. First, that artists, as artists started working with advanced technologies, in this case mostly game engines, AI, and blockchains, that the tech, the tech world will start to care and collaborate with cultural institutions. So that was the first kind of assumption. Second, the future art ecosystem would depend on a wide variety of economic pipelines from public investments to academic research to mass market products and ticketed experiences, as well as wider products like gaming itself. Third, was that the, inf that the infrastructural realignment of incentives and values between artists, institutions, publics, and technology sectors would amount to something like a 21st century cultural infrastructure. In this vision, Future art ecosystems underpinned by public stakeholdership would participate in the trajectory of technological developments in alignment with a wider social agenda. So that's kind of going back a little bit to Burnham's vision, really. By the time I co-wrote the third edition last year with Victoria, the first claim was looking less and less convincing. Simply put, at least between Western art institutions in Silicon Valley, Big tech was not that interested in art beyond its marketing department, and the power imbalance between the two made for a poor affair. The second claim, that art and tech ecosystems were broadening out wider value chains and commercial interfaces, looked more viable, from EU engagements with artistic innovation to larger scale commercial successes such as TeamLab, and later the vast pools of money uh, circling around NFTs. 
However, art institutions themselves, including Serpentine, were largely behind on this trend rather than, the, than needing it. It was coming from more blockbuster commercial projects and speculative NFT platforms than from the art world per se. The third claim, which called for a conception of 21st century cultural infrastructure, in which public institutions were alive to the technological and artistic innovation as well as, uh, as a public good, and also directed these intelligences to a wider societal agenda, remains unrealized but worth strongly stating. To do so would mean to realize something like Burnham's original systems-oriented vision, to conceive of cultural institutions not as architectures for displaying objects, but organizations in which experimental knowledge about society, economy, and technology could be prototyped and practiced. In phase three, which was a, uh, loosely about decentralized technologies, but in a way more about kind of uh, organizational logics using technologies learned from blockchain and decentralized web, uh, we wrote the following. If decentralized technologies have a role to play in long-term horizons for art and advanced technologies, it is an organizational logic for open technology stacks in service of public cultural innovation. The present trajectories of artistic R&D and societal technological development are intertwined but idiosyncratic because their value systems, metrics, and institutional structures are incommensurable and, and dysfunctionally mediated. Institutions are over-indexed on exhibitions and footfall, competing in a content-driven economy where their true leverage lies upstream in shaping the conditions of cultural production itself. Conversely, many of the processes of technological development that have driven societal change are under such growth pressures that they completely preclude meaningful reflection. Artists claiming to work upstream of this cultural production end up freelancing as strategic consultants. Experimental technologists are caught between underpaid technician gigs and corporate machineries. An open, full-stack approach to art and advanced technology exists only insofar as it exists as fragments spread across institutional bureaucracies, part-time practices, pro bono collaborations, and a very small handful of prodigious unicorns, these kind of all-rounder all individuals. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple, two or three people are responsible for like most of the simulation works that currently circulate in the blue chip art world. Elsewhere, they are built into proprietary productions and consultancy models where experimental R&D are made possible only by corporate gigs. So there we're kind of thinking about you know, Team Lab and uh, Marshmallow Laser Feast and these kinds of agencies and studios which do art but also make their money actually from the back end elsewhere as tech companies. <clears throat> in response to these circumstances, in phase three, we argue for interoperability across artistic ecosystems at different scales. Our recommendations are summarized under these three observations, briefly. First, that the low-hanging fruit for art and advanced technologies is to recognize that all the pieces of the greater inter interoperability are probably there, but the value chain needs to be realigned in order to allow common agendas to meet. In this model, which we called continuous service architecture, cultural organizations would grow to resemble interconnected infrastructural stacks comprising in-house tools, organizational methodologies, technical capabilities and resources, as well as strategic networks. At a more generalized scale, institutions might implement exposed application interfaces, basically an API, uh, enabling an as yet unknown users to plug into the organization's backend functionality to allow for more bottom-up and permissionless forms of participation. Second, we argued for a reassessment of the conditions of stakeholdership and risk-taking in artistic production. This move, which you call distributed ownership, would mean empowering public cultural infrastructures to assume a bolder mandate in creating an experimental public goods. Possible funding structures would be analogous to existing instruments like social impact bonds, where art and advanced technology projects with agreed parameters and goals would be bootstrapped by public institutional funding while inviting private investments with returns contingent on the project's successful completion of these goals. For artists and institutions, this could result in alignments over longer time horizons for R&D processes necessary for experimental works to take place. Third, we propose decentering the individual artist auteur in favor of valorizing ambitious and interdisciplinary productions in recognition of the already hybrid and interdependent nature of contemporary practices. On the one hand, this recognizes the de facto hybridity of precarious technology adjacent practitioners and proposes a socialization of risk through pooled income streams and pseudonymous collectivity. 
On the other hand, it proposes a model of distributed aura, allowing practitioners to work across multiple entities and identities in a manner which compounds rather than detracts from their value as solo artists. These pathways were put forward as starting points of conversations and prototyping, and hopefully bec will become a much, uh, part of a much wider array of strategies, and most importantly, collective operational realities. To do so, however, would ne also necessitate a deeper renegotiation of the implicit contract between stakeholders and culture, economy, and society, and to practically reorient the operational logics um, of artists and institutions alike. And quite abruptly, I will end there. Sorry, I only wrote that like t yesterday, so I had no way of not reading most of it, I have to say. Mm. Um, no, thank you so much for this very rich um, uh, presentation or rather maybe two or three presentations grouped as one. Um, I don't, I mean, uh, we're, we're definitely going to hear your <laughs> questions and oh, hopefully get into a debate, but maybe I'll start by trying to um, challenge you. No, uh -huh. <laughs> no, no, I think actually we agree on most of the things. So, but I'll try to, what I'll try to do is maybe to tease out some of the stronger narratives or a sort of continuities as they see. Um, coming out of this very complex galaxy of um, art and social um, <laughs> phenomena that uh, you charted for us. Um, so I do see kind of um, there's a chronicle of basically how we end up here mm -hmm. in the poly crisis and how the how that paralleled um, the process of financialization. Um, in which art is kind of art is sort of wrapped into it as a very small kind of sub subset of the economy, and that's kind of the economy of art itself, um, which you know it's something that I guess we're all invested in because we we work in the field of art, but ultimately we have to sort of rise above it and understand it as a very small subset of the larger economy and then the whole process of financialization at something maybe on a philosophical level um, as some kind of speculative, um, as presenting some kind of speculative similarity to the whole artistic um, um, endeavor itself, right? So the process of speculating, of making something out of nothing, of you know recombining different things so that all of a sudden you have more out of what is there, right? So the whole um, 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 uh, 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 financialization, as if we can describe it very generically, is basically that, and that's kind of also what we do as art if we describe it very generically. So there's that sort of structural similarity. Um, and then there's the whole question of what do we do as critical thinkers in that whole um, mix? And you put it nicely that um, somehow this whole intellectual rigor of institutional critique is somehow shorted <laughs> um, by um, the larger reality, and that somehow we have to rise up, also rise above this uh, the, the 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 sheer um, intellectual critique of that. Um, yeah. So what is beyond critique? I think so. It feels like there's all this mapping of the larger social economic context and uh, some of the discourses and rather spontaneous reactions within the art, such as APG, such as uh, the, the system-oriented art, and, 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 and so on. But it seems that you're trying to reach to a sort of new horizon with that. And that's kind of what we ended with, um, uh, the future art ecosystem, with its um, also you know, obviously you're reckoning with um, uh, the, the limits of that as well. Um, I, I found it very useful to have a reality check um, from the future art ecosystem folks as to, you know, what they put forward two or three years ago, how much of that holds true, or how much of that um, is proved uh, more of an idealistic um, fantasy of the artist, and, and how much can we try 
how much should we and how much can we map our fantasies, essentially, and our um, organizational development um, um, uh, 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 ideals onto all these other structures, all these other organizations. So that was very helpful. Um, so I guess, I don't know, maybe for the, for the uninitiated, <laughs> it might be helpful for you to bring up more examples, like, of, um, there are different, there are some, uh, some aspects I found interesting, so the, the public sector R&D, how could that look like? Because it might be a very much of a UK thing as well. Uh, you know, as in, you know, we don't even have a German equivalent or European equivalent to Nesta or anything of that kind where, you know, you have a lot of bottom-up um, sort of policy making in the UK where you basically come up with some fancy ideas and all of a sudden it can become real, as in they can attract funding. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it doesn't quite, <laughs> quite speak to the, the reality that we are in. So it would be interesting to hear more about um, artists entering into public sector R&D. Um, that's one thing. And then maybe in general just bring up more examples um, from the future art ecosystem. Because, um, you know, we have a lot of diagrams, but we need a bit more. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I know every item yeah, on this. I, so. I Yes, <laughs> but not everyone knows every item on this big map. So maybe you have to explain a little, maybe towards the, the mm -hmm. contemporary yeah, and um, the chronicle. Um, I, I realize actually I don't know enough about Nesta, but policy research in the UK does not feel that rosy, <laughs> as the way that you put it from over here. And also, I mean, the EU does have some of the like largest pools of like innovation and R&D funding that the UK has recently cut itself off from. I mean, like that ver 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 various kind of horizon funds and these kinds of things do like provide a huge, and I mean, my question about, the side question about EU um, creative R&D and innovation stuff is, it seems like a lot of money is being poured into projects that aren't very well vetted. Like it's, it seems like there are like quite significant splashy initiatives, um, like Starts comes to mind. And, but I don't know if it, by this point we should be able to assess to what degree those actually achieved something interesting on the kind of research agenda level, as opposed to kind of just kind of expanding the, the remit of the kind of transmedia community or something. Um, but yeah, so public sector R&D in the UK, I mean, currently, I think a lot of the things that we're proposing are not very obviously on the ground. The things that are on the ground that incessantly get referred back to and are like one of those, you know, they're, they're good examples, but they're they're limited, are things like uh, BBC's R and D department, which developed um, iPlayer and they developed a, a number of other kind of very early significant kind of uh, digital broadcasting tools. Uh, I think we in the future art ecosystems we use Transport for London as an example because they have um, an open API access to their entire kind of data stream, which um, allows you know other kind of transportation systems researchers and stuff to to tap straight into this kind of very powerful infrastructure. They also inadvertently, I suppose, give that all for free to Uber, which actively actually does them some harm but this kind of thing does, does exist. Another example that we pick up on is like Ben Cerveni's um, uh, institution, the Foundation for Public Code, which is a, a, a wider kind of infrastructural initiative essentially to look at like, um, usually not cultural infrastructures, usually like uh, transport systems and so on, and to think about, okay, why do we, why do we build a transport system for Barcelona and not like adapt that code base for Stockholm and like, uh, take the kind of uh, types of learnings and the, even probably the types of formats and different kinds of protocols, sorry, um, standards, uh, and apply them across this larger area of Europe and so that we can kind of learn and develop these different systems together. And I think for us, we actually more borrowed from that model to think about cultural uh, research in um, cultural institutions and art institutions because art institutions, as far as I'm aware predominantly still focus very much on the project 
ends, like the exhibition ends as the kind of primary end goal and interface of the thing. They might give the artist a lot of money, they might give an organization a lot of money to kind of uh, go away and do the research, but they d the institution doesn't really want to know about any of that. Or if they do, they'll help build like a minimum viable kind of toy model that's just about works for the exhibition, and then that'll sit like on GitHub again for like the rest of time, and no one will look at it again until we have the same problem later, and they, someone tries to build the whole thing again. So this like this this idea of being able to adapt interoperable toolkits basically across just basically maintain institutional knowledge across um, uh, an infrastructure of many institutions and to build on each other's projects. It's, it's a fairly low-hanging fruit because it just involves a little bit of extra labor. It does involve labor to, to make those things commensurable with each other to, to, to kind of, you know, write a readme file for a, for a piece of software, for instance. Or, um, um, so yeah, that, that, I mean, I guess those are some examples of like strategies towards like public cultural, uh, like, um, creative R and D kind of initiatives. In terms of like more sort of brilliant examples coming out of the art sector rather than like media broadcasting, um, film, television, gaming, is much harder. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I wish I had really those are really good examples, and maybe I'll go, I'll, I'll actually like remember some that we wrote about, but. But I think it's really coming a lot from these adjacent industries, which art has a lot to learn from as, a, as an institutional kind of space. I mean, the chart was really, um, it's a little more of an exercise in association than uh, a piece of art historical research. It, it's and it's, very, it's got a very particular view to it because these are, this is in a way my kind of trajectory through some of these things and like particular communities I'm kind of aware of and their reference points. I'm sure, for example, if you took a very much more, maybe much more European approach and looked at the origins of Ars Electronica and Transmediale and these kinds of institutions, um, you might find a different path, for example, a different set of arguments for like creative R&D. Um, I'm kind of going very much through the, the American post bauhaus -y kind of line, really. Okay, so we were having this conversation just before uh, this talk um, as to how could something concrete look like. Say we have 50 media art institutions mm -hmm. across the continent. <laughs> Each of them is engaged in some kind of research. I think on you have like 30 in like North, um, like um, okay, Westphalia. <laughs> like I'll find Westphalia. I think you have an extraordinary <laughs> okay, number. In, in, in 100 in maybe. <laughs> yeah, an extraordinary m uh, amount of... Uh, uh, media art institutions, all of them are engaged in some kind of research on the economy, on ecological questions, on data, sovereignty of data. Um, how would you group, how would you regroup that <laughs> into, <laughs> how, how, would you re so how would you reorganize these institutions? This is completely speculative and you don't, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically, exactly. I'm asking you like to to answer like a million dollar question because this is what a, a consultant should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> but since you put yourself out there, <laughs> Do they, uh, um, wait, uh, so, sorry, uh, I actually d didn't somehow didn't quite catch the question. It seemed so large. Um, so so given that we have okay, given with the existing institutional landscape that we have, that what we have been left with from fifty years of art and tech, let's say, what can we do with that? Uh, <laughs> um, does they want to jump in on this? Um, I mean, genuinely, I'm curious to think about it. It's a kind of, it's kind of, it is kind of the situation we're in. If if you could imagine a we, i.e., a governance kind of structure or a kind of institutional leadership that could even bring those things together, that would be in itself a feat. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not putting myself out there to answer that. But I think all of them are also fighting. They're writing almost the same kind of applications from the same funding bodies. <laughs> so essentially, <laughs> there's a lot of um, involution going on. Whereas, you know, we really feel that there could be like a systemic level, you know, higher, higher than in individual institution level kind of um, brief or agenda and, and what would that be? I, I guess, 
I, I mean, sorry, just speaking super vaguely, what that would be probably starts looking like having an industrial strategy, having like an art industrial strategy, as opposed to, you know, the, what, what the, the, the institutions that you're referring to in my loose imagination is are mostly, I think, came out of like late 90s, early 2000s kind of, like EU funding. Someone here might have actually done research on this. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, that's that was a, for whatever reason, I'd love to know that that w there was a there was a motivation behind you know things like tactical media and critical media arts around that time to to massively boost its kind of capacities. Uh, presumably, with the, some similar arguments about innovation, about kind of like public open source culture, about hackathons and fab labs and all of these things, which are still valuable in many ways, um, but. That was a that was a decision, right? That was a decision to let these things bloom, and I don't know. I I I feel like I really should know. I don't really know where how the decisions at the moment across Europe are being made around this. And if you were to really talk about carving out a meaningful sort of industrial strategy for you know culture and technology innovation, then you probably have to start asking some really hard questions about. Which things continue to get funded, which is you know just the politics. I, it's kind of actually, I guess, the gist of the reason I, I put the talk in this way is like, when does the politics actually emerge? When does like, when do the the conflicts or the decisions have to start happening? And why you know in the work that Victoria and I and others have been doing, do it, does it feel like I don't feel like I've been done enough like research in some sense because I when I, I look back at like conversations happening in the nineties and in twenty tens, um, there's like, okay, we've been having this conversation over and over and over again. But but there was never it seems like there was never quite the kind of urgency or something. I'm trying to understand that. I was talking to Suhail about this the other day. Like why did um, this proliferation of incredibly rich intellectual discourse around artistic economies, economic structures and the sort of like wider, you know, anti-capitalist politics therein, not really bloom into anything other than like, you know, post-internet this kind of era of like detachments. Um, and do we have an opportunity or a reason to do it now? Is art the wrong answer? <laughs> I mean. I guess, yeah, so the other way of approaching all of this is, um, I already asked you that question before, what can an artist not do, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> a lot of that is basically, um, not cheerleading, but a lot of that is sort of um, reskilling ourselves um, and upgrading ourselves so that we can suit more systemic, you know, challenges of systemic nature um, such that you know you will have to face when you I mean I guess yeah maybe one example for for, for those who are uh, we're talking very abstractly but maybe one example very one very concrete example is that I have this friend who comes from performance studies and is uh, was a performer for many years until he ended up um, as a serious game designer in the prime minister's office in Singapore. So basically designing um, all kinds of LARP games for the different ministers and, and pu public officers. Um, and you know, the scenarios range from very concrete, very cute, um, one such as there's a deep fake about the prime minister, prime minister. What do you do? And you cannot go to the official uh, newsletter, which will be the go-to solution of the government. So you cannot do that. What do you do? Right? And then they will be play testing this over and over. People will be taking out different roles, um, but also all the way to something um, you know much more speculative, much more. Uh, a, a larger in this time span, such as intergenerational justice, what do you do with the looming ecological crisis, uh, what do you do with the demographic uh, collapse of Singapore, and, and so on. So it's, you know, I, I think I think for me, I don't want to, and, and certainly Sean, this friend of mine, doesn't need to be introduced as an artist. I think um, Sean has sufficiently reskilled. <laughs> Uh, in order to be able to serve 
at such a function, and and that's that's completely fine. Maybe we should be able to just accept that you know at some point we all have to pivot <laughs> to something else, um, and we'll take some you know we'll take some um, uh, uh, qualities from art or s s sensitivities from art, but we also need to gain systemic literacy. We need to. We need to be able to interface with all these other um, sectors. So I guess, yeah, the question is really, where does the arts end <laughs> for you? <laughs> How do you pivot? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just like, eventually you got to get a job. <laughs> um, I'd, I think I think what you you know, I, I, I think for me, as an artist, I think I, don't to introduce you as an artist. not not in this room. I'm not an artist here. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's uh, that's a th I think that's kind of it. But it's like I think w for me, I'm not remotely precious about the identification of really art or artists. Maybe I take a too kind of like sort of pragmatic view, but what I do see is a a, a, a set of um, you know basically a, a sort of a, a wide subculture of like interdisciplinary intelligences have been developed for whatever reason sent over you know I'm teaching ATMFA students at Goldsmiths this year like are they going to become artists but they they they're learning something <laughs> and the over these decades that various you know various kinds of um frameworks have come about and various kind of intelligences and affordances come about through this weird institutional indoctrination that is like the contemporary art system. And I think being precious about which who is the where does the art end is much less interesting and saying, okay, once well, now we're stuck, you know, just like we're stuck with like two hundred media art institutions, now we're stuck with all these like random practitioners um, who have this, these different sorts of sensitivities sensitivities and like skills and many of them are, are actually skilled what can we do with that <laughs> and what what can we kind of apply that body of you know abilities to because i don't know art art still remains this kind of like vacuum that draws you know like like the, inc the incidental person thing it's like a, a vacuum that draws other possibilities slightly excessively in. And I think it's a nice, I think it's a very good thing probably to get drawn in as an artist and eventually come out and reskill and get a job that contributes to society in a more conventional way. <laughs> or like do all the more at the same time <laughs> and like have a private painting practice while you serve the civil service, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I have various questions. First, the first one is maybe not a question, but maybe a or maybe a question. Yeah, to uh, to go back, if we could go back to your um, to, yeah, this one. This is really nice. Um, to something that was kind of missing in there, but maybe you can tell more about it. Is um, AR gaming like alternative oh. reality gaming? Yeah. At least I couldn't find it on it. I, I think, I or is it somewhere over here? Yeah. <laughs> you literally say AR, but you know, like it's broadly in the kind of. Oh, so it's broadly in the kind of, uh, um, I mean, blockbuster art and tech, I would probably put next to Team Lab, Pokemon Go could go there as well, you know, I, if that's, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I'd, I'd put <laughs> it in that true. corner anyway. Yeah. No, um, so as an art historian, I have one question that is very similar to what me was just asking, but where exactly is the art, maybe, or to put it differently? Because somehow, I mean, I have a very or I, I get a very good uh, Im image of what you talk about, being about technology, economies, uh, systems, um, but art remains very vague uh, to me right now. Um, and some at some points, it almost seems to be indistinguishable from something like fiction um, or narrative, um, and which are also two very important terms in what you were just uh, um, presenting. So this is something that I w wanted you to... What is the role of art in here? Um, and can it be more than just uh, space to fall back onto once that things become very blurry for the various actors in these networks? Um, 
as in that. And then the second question would maybe also be like this moment, more on this narrative side, like the Owen Shkreli and all those kind of people. Like there is this, um, I found it really funny that you they almost need this kind of moment of revelation. It's kind of like this uh, um, end of the story. Oh yeah, they were found out. So the, the, the LARP or the AR ends and it comes back to whatever it is that we are calling reality. Um, and then with someone like uh, Musk, uh, who you ha kind of hesitated to to name specifically in that same group, but kind of like put a Jason to that, like he seems to be someone who's kind of hesitating to reveal himself as the fraud that he is, and now trying to even uh, establish Twitter back as a, a serious platform, but still not vaguing in there. So yeah, those two questions are the main questions. <laughs> Um, I I got the question. Sorry, I'm not, I'm just um, remembering again. I got the question about like where uh, what where is or what is art essentially in yeah. the, in this dynamic. But also, what was the other question? The other question, maybe like the, the Elon Musk thing. Yeah, like do these kind of narratives need this end of being oh, okay. uh, found out as fraudster or as uh, um, okay. Or at least as jokers in some form. So, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, for the first question, I don't know if I should have a better answer to this. I, I'm trying to work out whether like, I'm, I'm sort of um, deficient of some responsibility here. But like for me, art is a sort of uh, yeah, a, a, a set of kind of potentially fictional, potentially transcendental kind of practices that sort of pierce through this membrane between the speculative and the real, basically. Like I, that's I mean I can't believe I'm a documenter trying to give a definition of art. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But uh, maybe just like as someone who thinks about the things that they do as art, I start just like. I, I do those things without necessary reference to like an ideal form of what is, is art. I, mean, I can't leave that to the art historians. And I, I sort of wonder whether that, is, whether that hasn't been true over many histories of art, that like the, it's not, you know, art is almost something that you do in the name of art, um, which feels like a slightly kind of shell company, scammy kind of way of, <laughs> Dealing with this this question, but 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 I I don't know if I I, I mean I don't know if I have a I I think at any given moment if I thought about it for a while I would have my own like what I what inspires me most as like the most kind of interesting thing to do with art, but I don't know if I have a, a, a formal model, um, and I'd be curious to I really curious to hear yours. Um, uh, the other thing, the revelation thing, I think. Personally, I think no. I think uh, at the, so. I mean, this kind of plays back into the fiction and narrative thing. So, with the, with the book, for example, with the catastrophe time, uh, catastrophe time book, um, my section of that, the main claim that I'm kind of making is that after this kind of period of recent economic history, what we're experiencing now is this moment where, in some sense, the economy is coming down to earth, like the economy is kind of facing these like real constraints of have and conflicts have been like really building up over many a long time. And uh, it's not so much a kind of poly crisis as just a synchronization of like a, a meeting, a convergence of the various sort of trajectories that we, we have been kind of witnessing the slow progress of. And the, so therefore the catastrophe is this moment where like the narrative doesn't make sense anymore. But at the same time, after the economy has come back down to earth, there's the, the earth itself has become basically a speculative object. I mean, a lot of what I work on in that book is about um, climate insurance and modeling and statistical modeling and simulation and the way in which the only way we seem to know about the most urgent things about next year's state of the earth is through running statistical simulations that like create fictional versions of the next, like run 10,000 versions of next year until we find a sort of big enough sample to work out what might happen. And so this kind of fundamental becoming speculative, which is also a process of basically no longer be able, being able to use the past to predict the future, or at least no longer, it, it's particularly in the context of climate, um, is this space in which 
fictions start to take on you know a much more uh substantial dimension <laughs> like it, it they're, no, they're no longer there isn't really a, a a distinction if you like between fictional and reality or they start kind of shimmering through one another and i mean the way i think about this myself is also partly through the history of money because like someone like um Ah, I certainly can't remember her name, but there's a brilliant Victorianist and uh, economic historian who actually locates the kind of beginning of the fact or the idea of the kind of fact fiction boundary, the kind of splitting between these two notions with uh, the time of the, um, the South Sea bubble and the kind of forms of reading and the forms of kind of legibility that came out of like basically a speculative environment where you had to start working out whether something was real or not. Uh, in, in, in as, a, as a form of credit, and also um, the emergence of like people inside the economy, i.e., like people trying to sell you stuff, and then people who position themselves outside the economy, i.e., people who are trying to tell you stuff about what is true about the economy. So you've got your like Warren Buffetts and your Adam Tooses, for example, maybe. <laughs> um, so so and so these kind of different positions, like in and out of a, a sort of boundary of like the real of a particular system is, I, I feel like, a kind of interesting dynamic that we might, you know, I, I think has something to do with what we're experiencing now where we can't really necessarily make this this clear distinction. Sorry, the reason I'm talking about this is because of you're saying about this revelation. I'm saying that to a point, it might never reveal, <laughs> like it, to a point where, you know, I, I, has, I thought Elon Musk was some, some, a name I threw in there because unlike these smaller kind of punchline narratives, Elon Musk is a kind of too big to fail kind of fiction, if you like. Like, uh, he, yeah, he, he's and Elon Musk is not even just Elon Musk. Elon Musk is like basically a botnet. He's basically a kind of uh, it's it's you know these 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 figures that are mostly mediated for most of us through the internet are not like individual liberal agents in the kind of classic American one voice one vote kind of way. That they're they are they're sort of network actors that folds the, <laughs> the fabric of the, <laughs> the whole kind of um, situation ar around them as they move, um, so which is a very different type of situation. Yeah, um, thank you so much for, uh, for, for the talk. Um, oh wow, uh, I think this will be maybe also more of a comment, but I'm, I'm happy <laughs> for you to react. Um, maybe, m <laughs> moving slightly away from the uh, function of art, uh, the 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 place of art in this, um, and then maybe coming back to it later, um, I was kind of I think just your talk made me made me think about actually very like my my aesthetic feelings of these kind of uh, groups on the right side, right, and kind of what what uh, how how kind of um, Art is rendered here, and you you were you were mentioning kind of the the kind of being both in a in a kind of positive and negative tradition to institutional critique, um, and I was just kind of thinking that that institutional critique. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have to uh, look at my notes. Um, I mean, there is there institutional critique is still very very much um, concerned with aesthetics and in a way like kind of. Um, and kind of through this kind, through this kind of negative aesthetics of, um, be it some sort of kind of irony or, uh, or kind of anger or whatever, like kind of these um, kind of, um, and and if I would say that in a way it's kind of, uh, um, at least partially a critique of instrumental rationality of kind of art economy. And then you have have this, and you 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 pointed out this is kind of the inversion of kind of trying to be practical, trying to be in a way instrumentally rational, um, and uh, yeah, this is it's not a value judgment. I, mean, I just find it kind of kind of interesting because that's the aesthetic sense I sometimes get from it that it's kind of in a way trying. Trying not trying to be aesthetic, but also not trying to be like anti-art. It's not kind of in this tradition of conceptual art, of kind of trying, actively trying to, to. Um, I mean, speaking very broadly, but like these, they're not tr actively trying to say we're like we're not artists, 
I would say in these systems, and if we again speak very instrumentally, art becomes in a way, or kind of the, the promise of art becomes kind of the credit. It becomes kind of the, the, the kind of value proposition of the future, um, which is held onto, while at the same time what is actually being produced is trying to be as practical as, as possible. Um, and I mean, there are accidental uh, aesthetics, of course, uh, to it. I mean, also your, your diagrams are very aesthetic, and I'm not saying it's accidental. I think it's also because you come from an artistic background, so there is kind of an, uh, maybe um, an aesthetic element to it. But yeah, I, I, I feel like there's a weird kind of moment of um, holding on to art as this kind of value token in order to... to uh, to to have some sort of future promise, right? Because you don't actually, we're not at the point where we have actually um, the same kind of future credit that uh, uh, companies have. So we have to kind of use um, what's the word? It's not token. What, how how do you say it? Like a kind of a voucher. A, a voucher. You know, you you need to have art as a voucher of kind of future value of these very concrete, actually very concrete social and economic interventions. And I think it's just kind of, I don't know. It, <laughs> yeah. Right, it's almost like art is like a sort of jouissance or something. I kind of like, yeah, you know, yeah. the thing, at the sort of, yeah, the kind of thing at the end of desire that you're always <laughs> like chasing. You can feel it in the aesthetics of it. That's just kind of, for me, very interesting. It's just something I realized Mm -hmm. While while you're talking about it, so I thought it's it's kind of uh, yeah yeah um, I I I I guess um, and I, I think sorry sorry mm -hmm. like kind of not to go too much into I mean you you're probably very familiar with with uh, Marina Wischmidt because you're kind of uh, next door to her in in some some I don't oh, know uh, uh, Marina Wischmidt so yeah, yeah, yeah sure <laughs> so uh, but kind of to also say that the it's interesting because the speculative element of art itself becomes instrumental which is kind of a weird thing, right? Because it's actually that thing which is supposed to be the absolutely irrational element, and this is turned into a value proposition. And I mean, that's, again, it's very, very similar to, to how it is in the financial market. Mm -hmm. But this is, in a way, how, how these, uh, these um, institutions, collectors, whatever, operate. Um, and it's, I mean, maybe there's also no other way to operate now, but w in a way, kind of reproducing this idea of um, of uh, valorizing the, the irrational, valorizing the, the future and the speculative. I'd, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, um, quite probably quite a good summary of, in, in terms of the... Um, the the idea that the this the sort of irrational the 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 bit that you're only supposed to see out the corner of your eye is the thing that's actually being instrumentalized <laughs> in pursuit of um these other much more like uh, practical goals um yeah i mean i i kind of just don't necessarily disagree with you and on on any of that i think that is i i think you know i'm kind of I'm kind of just like throwing this stuff out, which is at the boundary of where my own thinking around much of it is at at, at the moment. And um, I think you're right that I think there is a, in a sense, there is a problem to be solved there as well, which is the problem that we were also maybe talking about shortly before the talk, which is basically uh, if you had the necessary resources, what would you do with it? Like if you had, I mean, it's a kind of problem for artists, it's a problem for the, the left in general. It's like, <laughs> if you had power, what would you do with it in a way? And at the moment, a lot of this diagram kind of looks like these kind of different practitioners using different kinds of sleights of hands to access power. And I guess that in itself sounds like quite a vulgar game. Um, but that, but at the same time, I think that is, you know, I mean, you, you could probably locate the kind of um, the substance of of uh, the, the goal in, in a sense in, in, in some forms of like social organization in some of these MX. And some of them, it has more to do with these like, 
you know, um, like I'm looking at the MMORPGs and thinking about game economies and stuff. Like it has to do with almost like these kind of prototyping of like new social formations. And a lot of it does, yeah, ring with the, the language of um, innovation, basically. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a value judgment on that myself either, actually. Yeah, I kind of think it's a thanks. Um, I, it, I need to, I also need to think about it. I sort of want to go back to the first slide where you say is art. Oh, you don't have to go back. Is the you know is art a low interest rate phenomena? And I guess you know what would be your what would be your take on the current uh, social economic condition we have in relation in relation, in relation to, to basically we have high interest rate and uh -huh. it's here to stay. And um, I have to backtrack a bit. Um, yeah, we have a we have I mean, a mm -hmm. also, yeah. Also, in relation to this whole, um, because you know the low interest rate uh, uh, fuels um, uh, uh, all this um, all this bubbles in the economy and VC and all of this. Um, so the whole speculation, the whole credit, and and how that sort of structurally um, maps onto art. Um, so we are facing a paradigmatic shift in the broader economy, and uh, we don't vaguely have a sense what it means for our lives, and, and, and probably much less for the arts. And it will be just interesting to yeah. go back to that question. Thinking super, just super, just completely thinking aloud at the moment. I mean, okay, what is, we've gone from low interest rates to high interest rates, that's why we see like Silicon Valley Bank, the various kind of contagion across the US banking sector, like that's what's supposed to happen. You squeeze the thing and it like, a few things drop out, and that's 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 correct. And at the same time, we're what what that reflects is the end of maybe an era of like essentially debt-driven U.S. consumption driving the kind of global economy, and that in itself seems to you know be reflected in the U.S.'s turn towards industrial strategy, and also China's turn towards. Well, should is there a major shift in China's industrial strategy movements? I'm not too sure. I guess they've always, they've had it for, but they've always done that now. Um, but the, this basically these kind of more obvious political conflicts, and I'm sort of and, and I'm just thinking aloud. Like, does that mean for you know for for contemporary art as a kind of space of kind of uh, in its most traditional role as a space of narrative and synthesis and kind of like um, kind of conceptual invention, I guess. Um, does it then fall to like will art will artists start to engage with this much more kind of like brutal politics in a way of like of you know of kind of the <laughs> the art, what does the art of industrial strategy look like? I don't know. Like what is the, it's 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 no longer this kind of like free for all of discourse, and it's much more like there are positions again, <laughs> and those positions come with complicated stakes and real politic. And I wonder what the the kind of uh, I guess art world's response to that might be. <laughs> yeah. That's a very interesting time <laughs> that we're experiencing. Do you have thoughts on I that? I don't necessarily want to <laughs> share it <laughs> in public. <laughs> no, I think I have a lot of thoughts, but a lot of that is, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you've done a really good job in, in sort of deflating some of the currencies that are held so um, so high in the art world, such as the critical value of art, such as, you know, all the institutional critique that, in a way, maybe this is the time when, given the poly crisis and given the, the um, I mean, you know, what do we have to critique? Neoliberalism is kind of ending, right? Because what we have is an era of state intervention. <laughs> A lot of state intervention is coming. So what does that mean, right, for the critically minded art producers um, under this, you know, this um, umbrella of um, some kind of, you know, the critical virtual of art. So I think that's 
you know, we're looking, we've been looking at all the other kinds of practices and, 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 and despite the sort of uneasiness and the, the sort of unholy <laughs> aspects to that, I think there's a lot to be, to be, um, to be learned from that. And I think we're all just prototyping and we're in the middle of it still, so. Yeah, I mean, to be, to be kind of clear, like, I, I, I like art and I also, <laughs> I, no, 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 no. I, I just want to say that I actually also like. I also my 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 take on it is like to to kind of. I want to like read more of those histories and discourses, but also more. <laughs> than, you know, I I don't really think that like you know contemporary arts kind of like a broader set of like all of its intellectual productions have somehow been like for nothing. But the same t and and also I guess now thinking about it, it's like yeah like post national imaginaries becomes something that's less of a kind of like a, a, a sort of poetic video essay of possible imagining and becomes more of a question of like how are they they reformulating and reorganizing and we were talking earlier there's a crypto conference in montenegro uh right now and it's been going on for a few weeks and it's like a kind of re grouping of all of these like quite significant groups with like billions and billions of dollars behind them all to talk around like this idea of a network state and this kind of you know like the kind of 2.0 of like um libertarian political sovereignty imaginaries and there's lots of these kind of formations happening in a lot of other experimental spaces <laughs> and uh, i think it would be interesting for like contemporary art to stick its neck out a little bit more around some of these as well a good note to end on, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I don't have anything better to say. So <laughs> thank you so much, Gary, and thanks to everyone for coming, and you're welcome to stay and discuss. Thank you, with everyone. Gary.